Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth. Uh, we've got a couple of guests that uh, I think are going to bring a lot of light to uh, some of the opium problems that we've been having the last decade plus. Uh, Teresa Almaquist, uh Mortensen and her husband Jim Mortensen. Uh, Teresa's uh, been an RN for 30 years, a uh, nurse practitioner for 16. She's also uh, been spearheading uh, a, a nice movement, actually, to get awareness and attention drawn to the problem of uh, the opioid addiction that we have in this country. Uh, sadly, they lost a, a daughter about four years ago now, and uh, her name is Christina, and uh, we're going to get into into that as well. And Jim and Teresa, are you there? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Hey, How so you doing? I'm great, man. I uh, appreciate you guys coming on, and I really appreciate the uh, taking the time out to to talk about this. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, I wanted to just kind of jump into everything. And uh, you know, let's just get it, kind of get into Christina's story because the way uh, you all came about this and the journey that you've been on so far is has been pretty intense. But why don't why don't we just start talking about Christina's background and how this all happened? Well, I want to thank you, Abe, for this opportunity to share our story. And our intent is to be true and honest, to bring awareness, and to hopefully spark change. So that's really the intent of the conversation today. But. Uh, Jim and I have been married for 34 years. We were high school sweethearts, and actually, Abe, you were at our wedding. I don't know if you remember that. I do. It was before I, I actually, actually started. It was before I started drinking, actually. So yes. <laughs> so we we still have the wedding gift that you gave us, um, but we have four children. Our oldest daughter is 33. Um, Christina should be 30, but she's forever 26. Our son will be 28, and our youngest daughter is 20. And we um, are a Christian family. We raised our kids um, with a Christian faith and foundation. We were very active in church, active in the community, did a lot of volunteer work. Um, our kids were very active in, um, in church, in Sunday school, in youth group, in ministry, in helping others. We never uh, had anything to do with alcohol, anything to do with drugs, um, honestly. So when this hit, we were fairly naive. We didn't really see the signs. Um, we believed a lot of the lies, addiction and lies kind of go hand in hand. Um, and the reason I share that is there is a lot of stigma and judgment regarding um, addicts. And there is this feeling that perhaps it's the parents' fault Somehow the parents didn't do <clears throat> enough. They were, um, children were parroting bad parental behavior. And, and Jim and I, honestly, I mean, we weren't perfect, but honestly, we were, we were good parents. We weren't perfect parents, but we loved our kids, and we, we were trying to do the best for them in all circumstances. So when this occurred with Christina, we were completely floored. Um, basically, her journey began... Um, from eighth grade into ninth grade, her group of kids that she was with, which we all knew from um, grade school on up, we um, were involved in all of their lives. They were very close to us. But this group of kids decided they were going to, to try marijuana. Um, for the group of kids, other than Christina, it was not a big deal. They kind of delved in it for a couple of years and then went about their merry lives and it didn't touch them long term. But for Christina, it opened a doorway. Um, it unleashed addiction and the doorway was never closed. Right. Um, so it started with marijuana. Marijuana wasn't enough. It turned into hash and then probably ecstasy, LSD, cocaine kind of from there. And then in high school, her drug of choice was meth. Um, but we didn't see the signs until about sophomore to junior year. There were some things that, that occurred that kind of brought our attention that something is, is not right. What, 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 was it, what was the inciting incident? What was the thing that like, kind of got your attention? Well, the lies weren't making sense. She was saying she was somewhere, and we would find out, no, she wasn't there. Um, the big health scare is she ended up with a tonsillar abscess um, because she was actually smoking meth, um, which almost caused her death at that point because of sepsis. And the abscess was so large that it almost occluded her airway. Wow. When we took her, yeah, when we took her to the emergency room, the physicians were not um, 
educated on addiction, so it wasn't a red flag to them. But I actually looked it up, and I was like, well, wait a minute. This, okay, the, the problem with the grades, because she was an honor student before this all happened. You know, the problem with the grades, the problem with truancy, um, you know, it, it kind of all made more sense when this health scare occurred. And then we actually tested her, her urine, and it came back positive for meth. Now, did you do that, or did, did you have a doctor do that for you? I did that. I actually went down to one of the rehab centers um, that the drug courts use, and I purchased pea sticks. Okay. Wow. And so up until then, though, you had no idea that she was uh, smoking meth or doing any of that? We felt like it was just kind of a teenage thing. She was going through a stage. We believed the lies. Yeah. Until we yeah. couldn't believe them any longer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was telling you earlier, my bro- I got a brother who's an addict, and he's been recovered for a while, but um, my folks didn't have any idea until he was getting arrested. Even getting kicked out of three continuation high schools uh, didn't register as him being anything other than just, you know, troublemaker. And, and they knew he was doing drugs, but they just kept, ex- you know, saying that, uh, he, oh, you guys got in fights too. I'm kind of going, yeah, but not like him. You know, I never try to put out a cigarette in a kid's eye. There's kind of a difference there. Um, Gosh, you know, and we uh, we had our eye on our daughter. Yeah, and we had our you know our suspicions, and we started you know checking up on her, and you know when we found out what was going on, we then you know took measures, and uh, she was in various rehabs. Uh, she was arrested. Uh, I personally had her arrested. Um, she had uh, actually come home, and you can just tell that she was high and loaded and mm-hmm. what have you because we had told her, you know, like most parents, tough love. You know, if you're doing drugs, we don't want you around here. We're happy to help you if you want to get some help. If you want to get into a program, we'll help you. But you know, she basically was out on the streets for a while. She came home. We knew that there was a warrant for her arrest from, I think it was a DUI. Is that correct, honey? Yeah, she had several DUIs yeah. that she didn't follow oh, through with. Oh, wow. And wow. I'm, sure the, the, I'm sure the DUI was basically under the influence of, of some drug. Sure. And um, long and short, had her arrested. The courts uh, said, hey, you know, you got to go into a rehab or... You're looking at some jail time, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then she got in a rehab program. She was in a lockdown rehab program for, honey, was it a year? No, six months. Six six months. Mm -hmm. It it was a long time. Yeah. I mean, she couldn't go anywhere. And she really came around. And then, uh, you know, she was clean for two years. Wow. Uh, And then all of a sudden one day. She got that itch, that little addiction demon started uh, scratching at her, and uh, she needed to itch that scratch. And, you know, she either got um, some bad uh, heroin that was laced with fentanyl, Uh um, or, you know, we, you know, just from the the coroner's report and and the the drug, um, and basically they said it was an overdose. And, you know, we'd like to see if we can change the perception of this by, A, having these overdoses listed as a homicide and then going after the people that, if you can make a connection uh, to the person that that gave it to her, um, you know, there's all all these rules. This has been a, a very sticky, hard topic because if somebody else administers it, okay, then yeah, he killed her because he administered the drug. Right. But if somebody gives you a drug that's poisoned, you know, like with fentanyl, you know, that's like elephant uh, tranquilizer. If, you know, somebody you know, gives you poison and you take it, you know, at what point is that person accountable? You know, long and short, these are all illegal drugs. Right. Well, and that was my next question. So the, co- the coroner determined that it was fentanyl and it, I, I can't get fentanyl over the counter. I mean, that's a Teresa, isn't that isn't, it's a painkiller that you administer at a hospital in super super minuscule doses, right? Correct. It's about thirty to fifty more um, times uh, pot- 
more potency than heroin and about 10 to 20 um, times more potent than, say, an MS cotton or an Oxycontin. Okay. Uh, where I work, but I am using it with end, um, end-stage cancer patients. So when used appropriately, it's, a, it's an amazing um, drug. It really brings a lot of pain relief. Sure. But in very, very small quantities, it is lethal. Um, and in Christina's case, you know, she was, like Jim said, she was clean for about two years. We felt like we got our daughter back. She was very responsible, was going back to school, got her job back, um, just a sweet, brilliant, bright kid, um, young mother, because she had a, um, an eight-year-old at the time that, right. that she died. Right. Um, and so we don't know what caused her to relapse. We have absolutely no clue. We had no idea that she had relapsed. Um, we did find her in our home, and there was drug paraphernalia underneath her body. Um, the drugs were actually mailed through the United States Post Office to our home, which is in violation of federal and state laws. Mm-hmm. Um, two days later, there was some methamphetamine mailed to our home, again, against these laws. And then two or three days later after that, either ecstasy or LSD was mailed to the home. We believe she obtained it by the dark web, but we're not sure. We gave all of the um, computer information, um, cell phone, all of the drugs to the local um, law enforcement, and they have done nothing with the information. Well, that was my- and, and another thing is, um, I, I want to mention that, yeah. what was it, uh, a month or two after, within one weekend, because of this heroin um, with fentanyl in it, how many deaths were there, honey? Was it six? Well, it was actually in 2017. There was about seven or eight deaths, um, all within the span of about three to five days here in Sonoma County, all from the same heroin that was laced with fentanyl. So whoever that person is, if they can somehow find who he is, he should be held accountable for murder. Even though the people took the drugs and they were wanting to get into you know a high state or whatever they wanted to do they weren't looking at dying right you right. know and when these dealers i mean it's like a doctor a doctor if he prescribes something and you die from it he's held accountable a drug dealer he prescribed you know, he gives you a drug without a prescription you die okay well yeah that's no, no big deal. They don't seem to go after them. Well, you know, well, the, so, and that's what we'd like to change. Well, see, well, this is this is kind of um, like I asked half the question. So the coroner determined that there was fentanyl. So you've got an an, an official autopsy, and law enforcement, and it's illegal for a civilian. I can't get fentanyl unless I go to the dark webs. Obviously, I can't get it. Can't get it with a prescription. I can't get it over the counter. I can't do any of that. I can't walk into a pharmacy. Why? Why wasn't that investigated? under some suspicious circumstances or, or whatever they could call it, but to, to launch an investigation, this, this person got fentanyl. And it, it, how, how come the cops are so lackadaisical or just laissez-faire about it? In, in some states, the law is they will investigate it as a homicide. In California, however, it is not. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I, I wish I could answer that, that question, Abe, but I can't. It does not make sense why this has not been investigated and there are no plans to investigate. I've been doing a letter writing campaign to bring awareness to this and it's, I've had a little bit of headway, but really nothing from the local law enforcement. Um, They just don't plan to, to investigate. And I think a lot of it has to do with the sense that these people are less than um, they're they're not human, therefore we don't have to care about them because they made this choice. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing about addiction, um, and one thing I know about Christina is she did not choose to die. That is not what she was attempting to do. Of course not. She was attempting to just get this thing that was going on in her head to be quiet. And I'm not an addict, so I don't know what that is. People have said it's like an itch that you cannot get to go away. And that's what she was just trying to do. She was trying to quiet that. She was. She did not choose to die. And I'm hoping to bring that point, that awareness to that point, that these are 
human beings. They are daughters. They are sons. They are mothers and fathers and grandparents and aunts and uncles and coworkers and friends. And there are babies and they're dying. Um, and there has been no outcry about these deaths. Well, and, and, and also, okay. oh, I was just going to say the amount of deaths. I mean, if I were to tell you that the amount of opioid deaths was more than car accidents and homicides, which it is, that should be alarming to somebody. And that's from the CDC. Um, and then there's all sorts of websites on there. I can give you them if you need them. But I mean, this is a huge problem. Yeah, no, well, see, and that's the thing. I mean, I wanted to get into that because, you know, it, b, b, well, let's just start for what we can control. And then I want to kind of get out into some of the ways that Christina got her hands on this stuff. But the, the things that we can control, for example, like Big Pharma, who makes this stuff, um, you know, the Sackler family, you know, Purdue, not to be confused with Purdue Chicken, folks, it's Purdue, the drug guys. But, you know, them, uh, Pfizer, all these folks that make all these opioids, whether it's Oxycontin or, you know, various antidepressants, they're they're not they're not answering to anybody. And 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 what 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 was it? You you guys sent me a statistic. We had like what two E. coli deaths, you know, in a year. And meanwhile, we got how, how many people a day are dying? Well, I thought it was two deaths by the the latest E. coli outbreak with the lettuce, um, the romaine lettuce. It's actually one. I tried to confirm that today. I can only find one death, but there was a national outcry. There was a uh, news about this. Um, and there are different statistics as far as the number of deaths, but the CDC in 2017 said there were 67,944 overdose deaths, which was a 13% increase compared with the 2015 to 2016 um, data. And that is about 177 overdose deaths, overdose deaths per day, um, which is more than car accidents, which is more than gun violence, which is more than falls. Mm -hmm. But you just don't see the outcry that you do for, say, E. coli or the latest shooting at Parkland in Texas. And I'm not trying to downplay that because that was an absolute horrific event that happened. No, I know. But when you when you look at statistically the overdose deaths far surpass that number. Well, and and I want to get into some of you, you touched on a couple of things earlier regarding you know stigma and everything else, but um, to kind of deal with the, sort of the, the the simple part, the simpler part first. Um, I mean, you watch the news, and who are they sponsored by? Defense and and pharmaceutical companies. It's like the the, the MSNBC is. Excuse me, MSNBC is never going to report on what you just said. You know, Rachel Maddow or, you know, Sean Hannity or whoever, they're not going to report on what you just said because they're sponsored by these guys. If and if and if and if the, and if those people do anything that costs their donor folks a dime, they're going to get fired. I mean, they they fired Phil Donahue for criticizing the Iraq war and that guy had the number one show on MSNBC at the time. And they said, oh, his ratings were down. How much were they down from number one to one and a half? I mean, the guy was was crushing, right? Um, so, so I mean, what, what kind of, I mean, I know you've been writing letters to and, and, and reaching out to your, your senators and congressmen and, and, and county people. What kind of response have you gotten from, from those folks? Um, I have received nothing from um, the president of the United States. Um, nothing from Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, I received information back from a local congressman. The two other local congressmen have not responded back. I have not heard back from the FBI. I did hear back from Senator Feinstein. Oh, um, I was surprised. Um, I am too. And so. she, um, and she seems very um, sincere, at least in the writing that she is going to be investigating. So I was happily. I'm excited to receive that letter, which I got today. Okay. Um, I did not receive from anything from Kamala Harris. Um, I got a form letter from the DEA, um, just kind of a, we send this to everyone that writes us kind of a letter. Um, and then the United States Post Office, um, uh, uh, Congressman Huffman's office gave me 
a link to go on and file a complaint. So I went to that link, I filed a complaint, and they forwarded it to the Consumer Affairs Department, and I have not heard from the Consumer Affairs Department okay. um, regarding where that stands. Okay. And all the, all the return after addresses are fake. I mean, you know, no, no bright drug dealer is going to put his real address on there. So of they use not. fake addresses and they go and drop stuff in the post office and send it that way. And, but again, the, the problem with local law enforcement is like, well, there's really not a whole lot we can do here. I mean, unless you literally hand them the person with the drugs, they really can't do anything. Right. Unless they're caught or connected right in the act, they really can't do anything, so it's very discouraging. There are lawsuits going on right now. I was looking at the San Diego Tribune. There's two court cases that are going on in regards to uh, the DEA going after a drug dealer that had a direct connection. Mm -hmm. And we'd love for laws to be changed to say, okay, these guys are murderers. They should be held accountable, and they should go to jail for you know, second degree murder at least, and that's that's what we feel. Sure, no, and I you know I don't I don't know that two people would disagree with you, and this isn't to be confused. <clears throat> you make an excellent point because this is not to be confused with say a a, a, a user or somebody who's just uh, a, it, like for example, ninety percent of drug arrests in this country are for possession only. So they're not these people you're talking about. They're the people that buy. So. You know, they buy the coke or the heroin or or the whatever they get caught with, and th- that's ninety percent of of, uh, of of drug arrests. And so, it's not these people you're talking about who should be punished, but people that need help. And kind of getting into your stigma um, point that you made a little bit ago, because society has stigmatized that to a point, it's been it seems like we've given the government carte blanche to jail these people. Well, on, on an unlimited basis, is that inaccurate to think? No, they um, they are criminalized, and part of my my hope in this is to decriminalize the addict. This is a disease that needs to have appropriate treatment, appropriate diagnosis, and appropriate support. And we need to decriminalize the addict and start criminalizing those that manufacture and distribute. Um, the drugs. And Jim had mentioned something about, you know, unless the dealer is caught red handed, it's hard to, you know, to, to slap any type of a judgment. But I feel honestly that they can, they can access my daughter's computer. They can access her phone. They can get this information. They know how to do it. They just don't want to. Right. Because of the, that's my personal opinion. Well, I, I, and I don't think, I don't think you have to look too far to, to see that you're right. I'm sorry, Jim, what were you going to say? I was just going to say uh, the rehabs are also not regulated, and really the failure rate is extremely high. Um, you know, they cost a lot of money. Uh, everybody's got different ways that they deal with, you know, the people that come in there. Um, we support um, the Redwood Council Mission in uh, Santa Rosa, California, because they're helping anybody that walks in the door. They give them a meal. Uh, they they let them hear the gospel. They basically say, if you want to get in our program, we're well we're, we're ready to take you. Come on in, and we support them because our daughter may have been in that position at one time. Sure, and so it's really near and dear to our heart. We also su- um, support the Rose House, which takes women with these problems that have kids as well into this home to try to give them some structure and try to get them into a a program to see if they can clean up their lives. But these other ones that are just making money off people, you know, some of them are like, you know, 50, 60, $70,000 a month to be in. Wow. And so there's big money being made in that. But unless you have some type of support system and just, just think about this, you're on drugs, you get arrested. The, 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 the judge says you need to get in a rehab. Oh, right. I don't have a penny to my name. Nobody's going to pay for me to get in this rehab. All these other places are wanting money. And even if you got in a court-ordered rehab and they made you go in there, they're going to send you a bill later to pay for all the stuff that they got to do, the drug oh, testing wow. and all that stuff. So, so, so you get in all that, you get out, and you're, like, deep in debt. And then, then 
what do you do now? You walk out the door, and where's the support? Your family's not there. Your friends aren't there. And you just go right back to what you knew, and you end up back in the grips of drug addiction. Well, two things I didn't know until this conversation, which I'm glad we're talking. So, number one, I didn't know, you know dumbass me, that court-ordered rehab was what the addict paid for. Well, it, it depends. It varies from county to county. And in our case, Christina had a very hefty fine levied on her, and part of that was the rehab cost. Okay. Um, she also got her her sentence expunged or her record expunged when she went through the program, but the fines were still there. Were still there. Well, that, so that, that's a. Oh, okay, sorry. Say, fin- go ahead. No, 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 no. Say your thing. I'm sorry. I was just going to say it's a heavy toll for someone to carry when they get out and no one wants to hire them and no one wants to house them. How are they going to make it in society? Right. Well, see, and then, and then, and then this, and to kind of backtrack for a second, um, I didn't know that rehab wasn't under any sort of jurisdiction of the health department. I thought they were monitored by the health department or something. Not again, it's a state by state um, kind of, uh, uh, law or um, a Florida my, is my understanding. And I haven't done a lot of research on this. I need to do more, but it was brought up on a support group that I'm online with mm-hmm. um, that the rehabs lack. Um, um, they can't get the people back in society because the they end up failing. <laughs> right. Um, they're not regulated consistently um, throughout any one state. And they use Florida as an example okay. of one that has very lenient um, laws, you can basically open any house and claim that you're a rehab center without any training and, um, uh, you know, any background check kind of a thing um, in certain certain counties. I'm not sure. I'm sure it's not that way in the entire state, but in certain counties. And the rehabs are almost set up to fail so that these people, especially if they have private insurance, will be forced back in the system so that the centers can continue um, to get reimbursement. Which kind of brings back the point of, you know, Big Pharma. Why why aren't they being held accountable for what they did? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it is it's the money. You know, you talked about, um, you know, and uh, MSNBC is not going to be talking about this because they sponsor the show, um, their, their shows. And I think Big Pharma has bought off a lot of our um, – uh, are, are congressmen and women, so they're not standing up for this because they're being paid to not stand up for this. Hundred um, percent. That's my theory. Oh, it's not a theory. It's it's a fact. I mean, th- <laughs> saying the moon landing is a conspiracy theory. Okay, fine. But this is a conspiracy <laughs> fact. Okay, I mean, <laughs> this is a conspiracy fact. There's some things they, they, like, and just a little side note on that term conspiracy theory. The CIA invented that in the '60s to make JFK people look like they were crazy. You had like 50 witnesses die in a five-year period, but it's a theory. You, you, really believe, mm-hmm. you really believe one guy did it by himself. Okay, that, that, that theory is a theory. What are the facts? Are you, had, you had seven bullet wounds from four bullets. That's, that's a miracle. That's like Jesus shot the gun, yeah. right? So, so don't, don't feel self-conscious about saying you know that, that that there's a that you think it's a conspiracy. I mean, and you don't even need a big conspiracy with people smoking cigars in a room. All you need is like one person to act on their own behalf, and if it satisfies the rest of the peer group, like you sent me that article on the on Rudy Giuliani defending um, Purdue and the Sackler family with OxyContin when he was a, when he's a private practice lawyer after he stopped being mayor of New York, and that case. Did everything for you know the Mercs and the Pfizer's and and you know the 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 everybody's you know whoever I'm, I'm spacing on drug names right now but you know th- they won that case in a way because even though they're convicted of a crime no one went to jail they just paid a fine and then they made it illegal to sue these people and you're just right. like wow that's that's amazing. And so when you say they're bought, that's not a that's not a theory, man. That's that's a fact. But um, and oh, go ahead. when oh go ahead. No, no. But, but, but when what? I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, you know, big pharmacy owes a lot of responsibility, or should own a lot of responsibility in the spike in overdose deaths, 
when they were manufacturing oxycontin and miscontin oxycodone, it was pushed in the mid 90s, late 90s as a drug that was not addictive. And you can search the web and look at these little films that no, you're right. um, that they promoted mm-hmm. to physicians. Mm-hmm. And it was highly addictive. And so physicians were inappropriately prescribing. You come in with a broken elbow or a skinned knee and you're given some Vicodin and it just spirals from there. You know, eventually the physician doesn't give you that and then you still need it because you're addicted. Your body needs this, the opioid, and then you you go to the street where you can get it. Uh, Unfortunately, nowadays it's laced with a lot of fentanyl and people are just dying because of the fentanyl. Right. No, I saw. So I saw, big pharmacy. No, but I'm sorry. Big pharmacy. I was going to say big. Big pharmacy owns a big responsibility in this. Mm-hmm. No, uh-huh. and uh, we also know that the fentanyl is uh, coming from China, and then possibly Mexico or China to Mexico, and then they started putting it in all sorts of things, and you know it gives. Um, I guess. Uh, it, it has fentanyl has a way of penetrating into the brain, whereas um, I, say, I think some of the opioids don't. Teresa, do you, is that correct? The way I'm saying that? No, they all they all penetrate the blood brain, um, brain barrier, but fentanyl is just much more powerful. So, so because of the high, you know, they started you know putting a little fentanyl in there, and they they were showing a vial of fentanyl, and these things are smaller than a grain of sand, and that amount is toxic. They even tell police officers if you can get some on you, just absorbing a, a small amount through your skin is lethal. And these guys are putting it into drugs. I mean, it's it's known to be poison. It's uh, elephant tranquilizer. Absolutely, absolutely. And and that was sort of the point. I they, I don't understand why these guys would lace, other than the quote cost. But you know, if you got a dead addict, they can't buy anything anymore. So I don't know why they would put these lethal amounts of fentanyl and say I, – I, about two weeks ago I saw online, I, I read an article. I, I forgot what – if it was New York Times or LA Times. But some guy had bought some cocaine and thought he was going to do a couple of lines at a party. And it turned out it was like 90 percent fentanyl and killed him right there. And you know, he's just dead in the bathroom and and you know and then when they did the autopsy, it was you know this insane amount of fentanyl and – Kind of like in your situation, it sounds to me like the cops didn't really investigate it past the fact that he got a bunch of fentanyl. So, but um, but you made a point a second ago how the, um, you know, the rehabs aren't regulated. It, it, it's probably something along the lines of, you know, if you've got increased recidivit, recidiv, recidivism, I, I can never say that word, recidivism, which means, you know, people going back to jail or people going back to the rehab, um. You know, ever since we went into the private prison business, it seems to me, from what you're saying, rehab almost followed the same business model. Is that about right? I would say yes. They're, they're very similar. Um, the success rate is is dismal, um, and a lot of them are set up so that you are a repeat customer. But unfortunately, if you are a repeat customer, there's no guarantee that you're going to make it back in that door with the type of drugs that are on the streets right, nowadays. Right, right, right. Well, and, and so then I want to kind of get back to the whole stigma issue because, you know, you, you can't make too much of this, and I'm not doing this in some sort of, you know, I need a safe space kind of thing. I'm talking about people having a genuine hard time working to get back into society. You mentioned that Christina got her job back. You, you mentioned that, you know, she she was, you know, back to her old self and then these things you know whatever whatever bad day or week she was having and she thought she needed to scratch that itch unfortunately it turned out the way it did but um there was a shame level there still that she after all she'd been through and put you guys through she still felt guilty in some way to come to you and talk about it and or or people that she knew at church for example um and it's not even necessarily church i can i can go you know start bagging on church for half an hour but I find that peer groups have a tendency to do that, not just not just folks that go to church, but a neighborhood or a city will shun somebody. And mm-hmm. and as you mentioned before, um, she was able to get her job back. But you you were telling me before that a lot of folks they they don't they 
it, it, it's hard to re enter into society. I mean, I see it from prison, the prison point of view, but I never thought about it from the rehab addict point of view. Um, like what, what have you seen, you know, in this journey, like what have you seen, uh, folks dealing with, with their kids or their ex spouses, you know, the father or mother of their kids dealing with getting them back into their lives? Is it, is it well? I mean, obviously, it doesn't sound like it's terribly welcoming, but in a lot of cases, I'm sure it is. But what, what, what's the, what, what, what can we do to start changing some of that? Well, I don't, I don't have the answer. I, I wish I did. Um, I can use the model of the mission that we support here locally, and they have partnered with a lot of local facilities. So they train these people in the program. So it's an 18 month program. They're learning new lifestyles. They're learning better choices in life. They're learning about their disease. Um, and faith is a big part of the foundation of, of all of this. So it's a faith-based program. But then they partner with a culinary school. So they teach them culinary. So then when they are through with the 18 months, they come out with a certificate. And then this restaurant, this um, sandwich shop, this um, you know, Denny's or whatever, will hire them. Mm -hmm. um, they also have a forklift program. So then when they get out, a place like Home Depot or Lowe's or a business contractor will hire them. Um, they have a house cleaning program. Um, they have a tourism kind of hospitality kind of a program. So they are partnering with facilities locally to help bridge them back into society. And that is a model that has been successful. The, the mission has a, a fairly successful um, rate. I don't know the actual statistics, but it's much better than what you would see from a court-ordered uh, rehab. Right. And, and just using Christina's example, she had no support. The last month or month and a half, they were told they had free time to go and look for a job. They could go to this local um, Catholic charities group to try to find a job there. They could go to this internet site to look. Everything that she uh, applied for that she qualified for, they denied her because of her history. Uh, she was actually rehired by the job that she had prior to going to rehab. They gave her a second chance, okay. which was really awesome um, on their part. But every other place she applied to would not would not. So that's just one thought is to have, you know, people need to step up to the plate and say, look, I need to be generous in this. I need to be other centered. I can help by giving these people a second chance. It's, it's amazing what that second chance will do for people. Sure. And believe it or not, there are people that have used drugs in the past that actually turn over a new leaf and get away from that. Yep. But again, they carry with them a stigma that everybody else around them that knows what their past was, no matter how far back in the past, oh, they're drug users, they're users. You know, stay, a lot of people stay away from them. I mean, you, you just have that stigma, and we'll probably never get rid of that. Mm -hmm. There's probably nothing that we can do to change that because people get set in their ways. I mean... We, we never thought in our wildest dreams that this could happen to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like, oh, no way. Yeah, I mean, the, the kid had everything. We were, we were decent parents. We were good parents. We went to all their games. We went to all their ballet performances, you know, everything. You had a Batmobile. Um, we were dude. active you, 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 in their life. You lives. had a Batmobile. How many dads <laughs> have a bat? House. How many dads have a Batmobile? <laughs> I mean, and a real one. It wasn't like this... <laughs> Go kart. It was a real Batmobile. It was phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but but again, you know, um, it could happen to anybody. And uh, you know, once they get a little taste of these addictive drugs, mm -hmm. there's some cases no going back. You know. So and we just got to have other resources to help these people that are out there. And that's again why we help those organizations I mentioned before, because. They're actually trying to help these people. There's been a number of people that have uh, come through the program. Um, I'll share one quick story uh, that just, I mean, I don't cry. You can ask anybody in my family. I don't cry. But when this guy shared his story, 
he gets up there, and this is the graduation ceremony of the Redwood Gospel Mission in Santa Rosa, and he gets up there and he says, uh, um, is officer such and such here? And uh, he looks around, and the guy raises his hand, and he says, everybody, that guy right there saved my life. I was walking down the road. I had had a house. I had the car. I had the family. I got addicted to drugs. I lost it all. I was at the point where I was ready to kill myself. I was literally thinking, okay, the next car that comes by, I'm just going to jump in front of it and let it run me over. Well, it turned out to be a police car. <laughs> the guy got out of the car. The guy walked up to him and said, here, these people with the gospel mission can help you. I can take you, or uh, yeah, I don't know how he got there, but call this number. If you want help, they will help you. He had been in the program for a year. He was just the, the happiest person to be alive when he was sharing his testimony. He's going to go back to, uh, I think it was Texas, where he was going to go back. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go and help the people there that were in my predicament. And you're just like, there you go. That's what we need. We need people helping others, just like us. We're helping people that are going through this. You know, how do I cope with this? Um, we got couples that come to us that lose children. How do you do it? And it's, well, there's no, you know, surefire answer, but the fact that you can talk with another human being that's been through the situation that you've been through and they understand where, where they are and where you are, and then you can start relating, you can start building from there, you know, but we're not going to get our kids back, but we might be able to help some people, you know, through their pain and suffering. We might be able to help some people stop doing what they're doing and turn a new leaf. And that's what we've really committed our lives is to helping others right now. Well, and the, and that kind of gets to the point where you, uh, Teresa, I think you are saying a second ago when, you know, folks kind of live in their little insular bubble and they think, oh, this can't happen to them. And it just seems to me, and I've dealt with this enough times in my life, and and it it just it makes me I have no hair left to pull out, but it makes me just want to figuratively, <laughs> figuratively pull my hair out because I'll meet these people, or I, I've got friends that have done this. I've seen it happen time and time again. They'll, you 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 have a challenge, or someone has a challenge, and they can't relate to it at all, and they're even kind of a dick about it, and then it happens to them, and then all of a sudden. They're picking up the cross and they're, you know, Don Quixote or whatever, and they're on the horse trying to charge the windmill. And you're like, where were you two blocks ago, man? I mean, how come you can't empathize with somebody? How come you got to wait until it happens to you to empathize? And, and I'm not saying you guys were that arrogant. I mean, obviously, you're sort of blissfully unaware for a while, but it didn't seem like you were ever <clears throat> arrogant about it or like, you know, well, this this can't happen to us because we're we're good people, we're decent people. Uh, you know, you you had a, a humility that I see a lot of people lack until it exactly happens to them. Um, you know, so and kudos, so and kudos. I mean, kudos to you for for recognizing that, and 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 also, you know, just a little side statistic. Kudos to you for you know still dealing with everything and 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 making your marriage work because the statistics of couples that lose a child that fall apart are staggering. And, you know, that's honestly that I don't know if these people ever talk to you about that, but that's something you could probably share in your story as well, because how, how you make it work is huge. And a lot of these folks don't make it. They just don't make it. Ninety percent of marriages that lose a child fail within the first five years. And um, it's just the pressure and the tension. And like you said, the blame and taking responsibility and and how you handle that stigma, like people going, oh, well, that was bad parenting. Well, you know, they're not they're just being arrogant. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and here you're talking to a couple. Now, uh, Teresa's parents didn't uh, do drugs or anything like that. They were very conservative. They were the same age as my grandparents. They were, uh, Teresa was, uh, uh, her mom was 42 when she had her. Um, in my case, as you know, I was raised by my grandmother. But both my mom and dad uh, did all sorts of drugs, um, you know, all, almost all their life. Um, you know, various things. And I saw that, you know, and I'm like, gosh, I don't want any part of that in my life. And I chose whenever somebody was like, hey, you want to get high or want to do this or whatever? I chose no. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And, um, you know, basically with my background with my grandmother, we didn't smoke, drink, uh, drink beer or alcohol of any kind. And to be honest with you, Teresa and I 
did not drink anything. I mean, we might have had um, one or two glasses at uh, a wedding or two of champagne, okay, that they just happened to pour, and we took the courtesy drink. Right, but right. But he didn't drink. Right. And, I mean, Teresa, Teresa, our kids were teenagers, and one of our friends actually – you know, saw my wife was all wound up because our teenagers were just putting us through hell and said, here, try a glass of wine medicinally and <laughs> it'll relax you. And I swear to you, and my, my, how old were you, honey? Like 37 or something like that? Um, no, it's about, I think I started drinking wine about age 42, 43. Yeah, it, it was way late. I mean, yeah. I mean, we were just like, and to this day, I, and, I might have one, one glass now. I, and I'm being honest and in, in saying Oh, no, listen, listen. I, 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 I make jokes. I'm a late bloomer. I didn't have my first beer till I was 23. I, I didn't have my first hit of pot till I was 25. And I tried my first bit of acid at 26. And, it, I mean, I wasn't 12. Uh, you know, none of it was addictive. It just kind of went on its merry way. And, it lasted as long as it did, and at one point I was sort of like, all right, well, been at this for a few years now. Like every four or five weeks we'd go to the woods and whatever, and I was like, wow, I had that same original thought now about 19 times. I think, you know, I think I'm done, and that was kind of about that. Um, but when you're 11 or 12 or 15, you know, your brain is still like a egg white that's not poached yet, you know, and and, and it's, the, the water hasn't made it hard or whatever or formed. And so you're really messing with a lot of a lot of growth. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of touch on a couple of things that you, or go back to a couple of things you were talking about. When we're talking about um, rehab. Um, and the other, the other thing, and this is, and I apologize for being so ignorant about rehab. I know so much about prison. I don't know why that is. But um, is 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 the fact that these guys? Okay, so for example, not all kids are going to have um, parents like like you guys were employed, and you know, obviously had insurance of some kind. Um, I didn't know that there was a lack of insurance coverage for rehab. Is 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 that pretty endemic? Is that pretty widespread? Um, it is. Um, with the Obama um, health care initiative, there were some changes, but and I work in health care, and it it doesn't cover what we need it to cover for chemotherapy. So I'm assuming that it won't cover for rehab what rehab costs are. So most rehab centers will not be able to accept the insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is not uh, mandated. When we were first looking at putting Christina into a rehab center when she was in high school, there was no coverage. I, I had health, health benefits, and there was no coverage for rehab. So I was looking at the cost, and it was going to be about fifty to $60,000 to put her in a 30-day program um, in Santa Cruz, mm-hmm. and we didn't, we didn't have it. Um, we actually got her into a study group, so she was actually in a rehab because she had not been in trouble with the law at that point, so they had some research trial going on, so she was actually accepted through a research trial because we did all kinds of outpatient counseling and and support groups and parenting groups, and Christina had to go to counseling, so it was a part of that, that group, and she was admitted um, her junior year into about a three-month um, rehab program, which we didn't have to pay for because it was through this, this research. But it, most rehab centers, the cost is not going to be covered by any type of insurance plan. And not to mention a lot of kids fall off when they're a certain age of your insurance program anyway. Right. That's right. Yeah, so 26 or 27. I, th- I know I think it's at 27. No, 26. Yeah, 26. And, and yeah, 26. I think uh, – I don't think it's unmarried. I think it's just up to 26. Yeah. Yes. Um, which kind of gets us into, you know, I mean, it, it, universal health care. I mean, obviously Medicare doesn't cover rehab, correct? So, like, if an older person had – uh, an issue like this, they they couldn't get rehab, correct? You know, I honestly don't know. I would have to research that. I will want to say no, but I could be wrong. Well, the only reason, and the and the reason I ask that is because I'm a big I'm a big idea, a big proponent of the idea of single payer health care, and you can't really even talk about that in this country without people freaking out and calling you communist. I'm sort of going, well, um, if you do the numbers, it's actually very capitalist because the idea of government is to help business. And if I go into a 50 man group that has 50 employees rather, and that owner is paying about 2 million a year for health insurance, a million five. And I say, Hey, I got, I'm just increase your Medicare contribution by 
and we wipe out that healthcare cost, he's going to be happy. The employees paying three, five hundred, or a thousand dollars a month are going to be happy because they just got a raise, and then they're not looking at a five or six figure copay if they do get sick. Mm-hmm. And you can include rehab in that. Um, you know, if you really wanted to make something that's going to help the people and not have a bunch of politicians bought off by big pharma, right? Right, right, and. Um, the rehab needs to be, um, these people need to be trained. Um, they need to be credentialed. Um, it needs to be state mandated, county mandated about what is allowed and disallowed in, in the rehabs. I, I read one um, article about a certain rehab had a contract with a, a P test. So they would get reimbursed $1,500 for each P-test that they did. So they were P-testing these addicts three and four times a week when they probably didn't need to be P-tested that much, but they got $1,500 every time they submitted a test, and that was through private insurance. So that that kind of contracting needs to stop. Right. Um, and. And also just to, to touch a little bit back on, on the stigma, um, my online support group, they coined a term which I, I really like because it, it just is, is all in, encapsulating almost. They called it the ig- ignorant arrogance or ignorant elitism. Mm-hmm. And it's this idea of it can't happen to me. I don't care because it can't happen to me. Um, so I liked, I liked that, the verbiage that they used. It was... Um, um, it, it really um, gets down to the root of what's going on when people <clears throat> show um, judgment and and cast stigma and shame on on uh, on addiction or, or on anything that we consider socially inept. Yeah. You know, suicide also has a a big um, stigma attached to it. Mental health has a big stigma attached to it. Those things need to change in order for us to move forward in helping these people, and that's. What we should be about is helping other people, and that's one thing that I have learned through all of this because I'm trying as a human being to make something good come from the circumstances that we are in. And and one of the biggest lessons that Christina has taught me is humility Mm -hmm. Um, and and compassion for others. Um, You know, we, we, we walk around and we think we have tomorrow and we think we have five years from now and we think we have 10 years from now, and the reality is we are not guaranteed even this afternoon. So we have to live. We should be living right. We should be living compassionately. We should be living generously. We should be living other-centered. Um, truth matters. Words matter. You know, be, be compassionate. That's what I'm trying. That's what Christina's death has taught mm-hmm. me and, and continues to teach me. And you were asking how, how we're surviving in our marriage, and that's you know, one way is um, there's not a right way to go through this, um, but that's this for us. This is our way is to just stay busy mm-hmm. and to stay other centered and other focused and to try to make change. So by you allowing us in this conversation tonight, we are hoping to spark change. Well, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that's what happens. I mean, you know, when I started this, the idea was, you know, one conversation at a time, one bar at a time, one party at a time. You just talk about it and have a conversation. Ask some questions. I mean, I, I'm last five eight years. I'm I'm so over identity politics. It's ridiculous. And when someone says to me, "Well, that's a bad idea," I I want to know what the root of that is. You know, why why can't we ask the question? You know, if it's mm-hmm. it's you know, people have these significance issues, right? Or these these things that make them feel good. They like certainty. They like uncertainty. They like um, to feel love. They like to feel uh, a like significance. You know, um, and and that's why, you know, and I'm kind of speaking to your point, for example, what you're doing is a way to gain significance for yourself and to stand above what human nature would dictate you do, which is bitterness and cynicism and just saying it's all worthless anyway. And that's where a lot of people get their value. Um, you know, violent, violence won't go away either. People always go, oh, when are we going to have an unviolent world? We're not. You know, if you're a third world leader and you got no education and no power and no money, how do you do it? End of a gun. Suddenly, you own the country. You're getting money from the IMF or whoever else, and now you have power. You've got love. You've got, or at least love, you got to buy. You've got significance. You've got all those things with just getting a gun. Don't have to work for it. Just go get it. And that's why violence won't go away. And as long as people want to feel superior 
um, you know, stigmatizing others and finding a way to belittle someone who's having a hard time is a way these people do feel good. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like almost part of your your mission as well is to you know not only rise above those folks, but to get people that are in your position to rise above them as well and kind of have this other um, – you know, outside the self, excuse me, thinking that, like you just said. Well, that's our, that's our goal. And that's one way that we're healing is to stay active and, and to try to be focused in, in making a positive difference to make something positive come from this. (laughs) And um, like Jim said, our, our hope is that the laws are going to be changed that anyone that manufactures and distributes illegal pharmaceuticals, if that results in a death, that equates to a homicide. And if there's a homicide labeled on the coroner's certificate, then that requires an investigation mm-hmm. and hopefully prosecution. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that will be a deterrent. Mm-hmm. And then we can see these these numbers drop, these overdose deaths drop. They're um, staggering. We also... Yeah, there. I mean, and and there's no there's no information about them. You don't turn on the news and, and hear about this this um, these deaths, but you do hear about the one E. coli death, um, but you don't hear about the 177 overdose mm-hmm. deaths. And I'm not trying to downplay the E. coli death. That no, I understand. Horrible. No, I understand that. It, and, and and no one would only an idiot would think that you are. By the way, but continue. I'm sorry. And, and then another thing we're hoping to change is the support for um, for addicts that are trying to reenter um, to society. And I think big pharmacy in their they're a big culprit in what is taking place, and their fines should help to sponsor these type of centers. That's that's a thought that I have. I don't know how easy or hard it would be to to get that happen, but I did. Um, in my letter to Diane uh, Feinstein, say that that was one of my hopes is that these fines would support these um, centers, and then also to change the stigma, the judgment, the shame, to make the world realize that these are human beings that are being affected. Um, they are not quote unquote junkies and losers and everything else that that people label them as. They are they are human beings and they matter. Their lives matter. Sure. No, and I mean, and that was my. I was, uh, we got a few minutes left before we got to start wrapping up, but I wanted to uh, quickly ask uh, how. I mean, I know you guys have been working on this together for the last several years, but how have the rest of the kids been handling all of this? Jim, you want to take this one, or you want me to? Um, you know, um, it, it's been hard. Uh, they have times when they're they're crying, and you know, especially around the holidays, which is about the hardest mm-hmm. time to miss a loved mm-hmm. one, and. Um, we try to remember um, our daughter in a positive way. Um, we we basically uh, every year we go out to a restaurant and we remember her on her birthday, and we usually pick somebody and pay for their meal. We look for a young couple that might be struggling, or you know, or somebody that we think might need it. Um, this last time uh, we were in this restaurant, and one lady walked in out of the whole restaurant, and I just turned to her and I said, uh, are you alone? And she goes, uh, yeah. I go, would you do us the honor of joining us at our table? I'll pay for your meal. And she just went, wow. And she came over and sat at our table and joined us, and we shared, and um, we shared that the reason we were there is we were celebrating our daughter's uh, birth date, and um, I says, you know, normally, you know, this is what we do, and but there's nobody else here, and we're glad that you're here, and got to know her a little bit better, and uh, it's just, you know, funny how people, you know, cope, but, you know, we we uh, do something around the time of her her passing, and we do something around the time of her birthday to to keep the pain mm-hmm. at bay, to to keep the sorrow mm-hmm. at bay, um, you know, and that's that's how we deal with it and then we try to say okay if our daughter was still out there in the throes of addiction what would what would anybody be able to do to help and that's where you help these organizations that are helping the lowest of the low and that's why we help them right you know because they, that those girls that are coming in there they could have been where our daughter was you know but, but um you know our our son 
Um, it's been really hard for him. He was uh, close in age to uh, Christine, our oldest daughter. It was tough on her, and it was really tough on our youngest mm-hmm. daughter. Um, she was here the day when we found her mm-hmm. body um, and just uh, was just really hard. And um, But I, I look, you know, look back at things, and I go, okay, well, she was a surprise child, and she's like a clone of of Christine, and I just think the good Lord that I got her mm-hmm. um, as a surprise because I look at her and I go, "Wow, you're you're so much like her." I can still see a little bit of her in you, and same thing with her daughter. I can see uh, her daughter. Her daughter has a hard time uh, dealing, and the daughter's been going to uh, um, a psychiatrist. Um, uh, is it a psychologist, psychiatrist, honey? Which which so, uh, a counselor? I, I don't think she's, a counselor. Yeah. A counselor, not not a yeah, just a th- just to be able to mm-hmm. talk. Yeah, mm-hmm. therapist. Mm-hmm. And and so she's in really good spirits. But again, it's hard um, when we were at the the woman's home and our family took upon ourselves to redo one of the rooms because the rooms were in such horrible conditions over there. Our whole family got together. We went over there and we said, hey, we'd like to redo a room if that'd be okay with you. And we got their blessing. We redid the room when we were there for the dedication on Christina's birthday, right before this dinner that I just mentioned. Um, she broke down and started crying. Um, she still doesn't know how her mom died, right. but her mom's gone. And I think the good Lord for her because... She's a clone of my daughter. I look at her and the things that she does, and I'm just, I get joy. You you try to get joy out of the things in life that you can still get joy from, and you try to put away the sadness and the sorrow. Well, listen, man, um, we're, we're going we're gonna to really wrap up here really quick, but I just want to thank you for coming on the show, and, and kudos, man, because, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't have a dog in this fight anymore. It's been a long time since I've even been to church and I got maybe five, 10 friends that uh, pr- profess a faith of some kind that are actually the few people on earth that walk their talk. And you guys are in that group of people. Um, you know, you, you've respond, you, you've responded really uh, kind and, and as good as anybody can in the situation and, and above and beyond. I mean, people don't buy people dinner, man. You know, that that's, you know, that's not a, you know, and that's not a, like a million dollar deal. It's just like, you know, like sometimes I'm on, I'm on on Seventh Street or Sixth Street in Austin, and some guy will ask me for money, and I'm in line at the falafel truck. I'm like, hey, I'll buy you a falafel, you know, and and I know he's got a problem. That's the right. And I, and I know he's gonna. I know he's just across the street's a, a mission that they decided to put there, and it's just you know all these guys with real problems. It's not like you know a jobless guy. It's like these guys have some real problems. They need help, uh, and I'll be like, hey man, I'll, I'll buy you a falafel. And the, and nine times out of ten they'll get mad at me, but I'm just like. I'll get you falafel, man. I'll get you falafel bottle of water, and that's you know that's about all you can do. But um, it takes it takes folks like you to go through something like this to actually be able to dare I, dare I use the word minister, you know? And it's it's again kudos and thank you for coming on the show, man. And guys, I know this is probably a heavy topic for some of you, and if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to sleep tight. <laughs> Trish has one final thing that she needs to say. Well, I I always. Say it. So it's kind of my my motto for from Christina is that life is a gift. It's not guaranteed. So always be gentle and kind. And thank you, Abe, for allowing us to share our story. Thank you for buying that gentleman the falafel. You have no idea how much you probably touched touched his heart. So thank you for doing that. And if everybody did just something small like that, it could change those people's lives. Sure. Just that one little thing, and then you know, but. A lot of people don't, but anyhow, thank you, sir. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon, man.